uh, machine learning and AI is very, very significant in terms of um, how Bing and Google use, you know, figure out algorithm rankings in search, figure out features in search also, like feature snippets and where to lay out different elements in search. It's all done based off of these machine learning algorithms, which make everything much more complicated. In terms of using AI or machine learning for SEO purposes, like generating content or stuff like that, that's been fairly interesting because this last helpful content update seems to have hit a lot of machine generated, AI generated types of content. So I found that very interesting as well. I don't know. But that's, I just found it very, very interesting to see that. Welcome to Endless Coffee Cup, a regular discussion of marketing news, culture, and media for our complex digital lifestyle. Join Matt Bailey as he engages in conversation to find insights beyond the latest headlines and deeper understanding for those involved in marketing. Grab a cup of coffee, have a seat, and thanks for joining well, hello, dear listener, and welcome to another edition of the Endless Coffee Cup Podcast. I'm glad you're with me, and I think you're in for a treat because I've got a longtime associate friend from the, the SEO industry. If you have been in SEO for any number of years, you know the name Barry Schwartz. And Barry, thank you so much for being here today. No, thank you so much for having me. It's been a while since we you know, met up, and we've been, I think, in the SEO search marketing community for close to, you know, probably 20 years now. So it's been it's been a fun space and it's great to catch up with you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. And yeah, like you said, it, it's been 20 some years and it's funny talking to other people in the industry. And, and now we've hit that second decade and some of us have gone even a little past that. And it's, it's you know, you're starting to realize like, oh my goodness, this this group of people that were very early in SEO and, and kind of grown through that, you have been a fixture in the industry because, you know, like the rest of us, you, you, you know, tried to figure out what's this all about. But you took a different tack and you started writing about these changes. If you could tell me, what, what were you doing? What was it that caused you to be interested in search engines? And what inspired you to just start writing a blog about, about search engines? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I have and have still a software development company. We do a lot of web uh, and mobile applications, mostly like software applications very little front end work these days. Um, we, but initially building out stuff back in the old days was building out websites that just worked. And a lot of people had, you know, really bad front page websites and stuff like that. So we built <laughs> custom stuff. And one of our clients was like, how do you get into these like search engines? And I'm like, Oh, look into it. And I researched it and I'm, you know, looked online at the different discussion forums and so forth. And I bought some books and so forth. And I found it fascinating, like discussions going on in some of these old forums, like the old Webmaster World forums, Jim World, SEO Chat, High Rankings, Creative Site forums, you name it. It was just so many smart people discussing how algorithms work, you know, the, uh, the patents behind it, the algorithms behind it. And it was just fascinating to see the communities talk about all the different changes. Back then, it wasn't changing as fast. You had the 30-day Google dances where the data centers right. would be jumping around and page rank. Uh, so it was very fascinating to watch. And I'm like, you know what? There's so much knowledge here. I want to keep a log of this information. So I started something called the Search and Roundtable, which basically is a blog. Um, um, and I basically cataloged all the, I think what I, what I classified as the important conversations that I found in the search marketing community over the years and I kept doing it. I just, I just love doing it. And I kept writing about it. It's not, you know, it's a hobby. It's not necessarily where I make my money or I'm making money doing the software stuff, but it's definitely something that I found fascinating. I kept doing it for almost 20 years now and I continue to do it today. Amazing. Amazing. And wow, you are bringing up some blasts from the past with high rankings forum, webmaster world, gym world. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I mean, some yeah. of those. Wow. But that, I mean, that was, that was our social media back in the day, you know, turn of the, I think early two thousands. And that's where, that was really the one place we would meet. And, and it's fun. We would argue, we'd debate, compare notes about things we're noticing. And I mean, what a world that was where you actually got to know people because it was it was kind of the same group. Every once in a while, someone new would come in and, you know, but they would ask questions and, and contribute. And it was really, I look at those discussions that we had back back then, and they were very in-depth, very well-reasoned. You, you had your flare-ups once in a while, but... Uh, once in a while. I think more than <laughs> once in a while. But no, you're right. And everybody had aliases back then. Nobody used their yes. real names. Then we met up at conferences and slowly we started to like get or put our real names out there. And then <laughs> where Matt Kutz was under the Google guy name in Webmaster World. And we had people from Google actually participating in these conversations and saying, sorry to give us information, trickle in information, which is not just us making up our 
theory is, is actually Google saying, no, you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about, which is fun. Yeah. And then we had you know, obviously social media. So a lot of that conversation now, not all of it, but a lot of it has moved from, you know, webmaster world and discussion forums to Twitter, Facebook, and so forth. So yeah, thank God we have these online communities because it's, it's a great place for people to connect. Yeah. And it was interesting because, I mean, I remember reading posts that were four or five or six paragraphs, you know, with citations, with screenshots, because people were making a case that this is what I think is happening. And then you would have just this long, long thread of debate and back and forth. You know, you don't see that, you know, through Twitter. You don't see that on the, the other social media. It's more reaction. It's more a one or two sentence thing. But I kind of miss those days where it was it was paragraphs. It was it was almost a, a dissertation of what I think is happening on the search engines right now. <laughs> I mean, for sure. You had people like Gumworm Johns, you had Bill Slosky, rest in peace. Oh, um, yeah. Some really amazing personalities that even to, even like throughout today, they still provide those long form stuff. It's just generations change. People are want instant gratification. It's TikTok. It's not, it's not long form stuff. And it's a kind of a shame, but at the same time, you know, we've got to kind of adapt to what people were expecting now and go with it but the yeah you said it was just an amazing place to be back then absolutely well so you've been doing this for for yeah almost 20 years now what what in your mind has been the biggest change or sh in the search engine world in that time that that affected let's let's say how it affected seos or how it affected businesses Right. So there's a bunch of algorithm updates that actually directly impacted SEO companies as well as businesses that were relying on SEO. So the first one, most, I guess, earliest one was probably the Florida update back in like 2002, 2003. It really like said, hey, SEOs, you can't just go ahead and like spam us and generate junk content. You got to really do something that was good. And SEOs were like, oh my God, I got hit. My business is dead or some other businesses that were depending on third-party SEOs, their businesses were dead. And everybody's like, oh, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. You got to go and diversify and do other things like, you know, snail mail and, you know, you know, whatever it might be like back in the old days, like TV ads and radio ads. And now you see the same thing with like these other algorithm updates. I mean, probably the most significant and most well-known outside of like the Florida update, which is almost 20 years ago, is, you know, it was the Panda update and the Penguin update. The Panda update was targeting people who were generating really low quality content just for the purpose of ranking well. And a lot of people who are generating that type of content, a lot of internal SEOs working at like these massive companies, Mahalo and so, and so forth, got hit really hard. And those businesses just failed overnight. And then Penguin was like, that hit the SEO SEO business really, really hard. Right. Because Penguin's more about links. And SEOs were really into links back then. And links work very well. You can, you can rank for anything with just a few links, really good quality links, even if your site was not about that link. So that was hit hard. I think that was in, 2012 and 2013 or 2011 2012 something, something like that around there yeah yeah i remember that um, because it was yeah there was a whole thing about just get that link on another site and, and i remember there were a whole series of seos i can name some names who would write Don't. ridiculous <laughs> articles and they would get picked up and, and i remember one guy telling me oh yeah i just made it up you know, but it got picked right. up and I got a link and immediately, and I'm just looking, I'm going, are you serious? <laughs> you know, why would you do this? But yes, you generated a link, you got this, but this, this link at all costs or getting this, I mean, the, the debates that came out of that, but it was, it was an amazing, it, I think you mentioned this, it's like this cat and mouse game between a lot of the SEO industry and, and Google, especially, I mean, have you seen where, where, in throughout outside of the industry what's the reputation of seo do you encounter that much at all where where people will share an opinion of it or what what they they view it as yeah i don't think it's good it's never been good i don't think it's getting any better sadly i thought for some point at some point it was getting better but from what i see and i'm very it's hard to say something you know somebody who's so involved in this community what does the outside think of it because i'm so inside of it but it's not good i got an obvious you know it's not a good thing it's like we are known as like people that try to manipulate Google and try to drive people to an old fashioned was like, you know, you, you rank for a Disney cartoon character and you send them to a porn site. That's what people think of, of SEOs and it's bad and it's not true, but it's what we're kind of known for. But again, I think it goes hand in hand with Google trying to build quality algorithms that don't let that stuff rank. SEOs trying to build websites that are really generated for users first, which Google's been saying for 20 years, but nobody really believed until 
probably after the Penguin update and after these core updates. And, you know, this stuff just tends to work well. I mean, you want to build something that's good for users these days. And it's not going to be like one of those old debates of like, is content king, is links, are links king? Clearly it's content now. And I guess that Joe Leyland was, was right from day one. So, Absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, as someone who, you know, my... When it comes to SEO, my idea has always been user first and what do they want to know and answer the question rather than kind of going around and trying to, you know, trying to fool Google, trying to create that false relevance, even though there's a significant part of the community that does that and Google combats that. But it's interesting that, you, you know, you look and see who tends to get tagged in these updates and who doesn't. And I think you get your most vocal community or the ones that are you know, uh, trying to make that false relevance. And those that don't get hit by the updates just kind of stay quiet and, and they just do what they're doing and, and not see anything. I mean, but when we look at the past updates, you know, you mentioned Florida, which I, I remember that was the first major sort of quality check where Google said, like you said, no more. You know, we're going to start. That was a first major one. And I remember the fallout from that. People were angry, angry yeah. about their sites just all of a sudden disappearing out of Google. But what's the trend? I mean, where's Google going in all this? So we can go all the way back to the Florida update. And now at, the, at this point, while we're recording, we're, I just read your article about so far the quality update is a bit disappointing. What's, you know, when we look back at Panda, Penguin, Florida, quality, what's the end goal? Where's Google going with these updates? Yeah, right. It's called the helpful, the most recent one is the helpful content update. It seems to be kicking in this morning. We'll see. It's too early to say so. But anyway, you can see the trend is, is clear. The, the trend is Google wants to rank the most relevant, most useful, most helpful pieces of content that are have the most accurate and most useful information for users. And you saw this. Clearly, with these core updates, specifically in the YM, YL, your money, your life categories, and Google's been talking about EAT, expertise, authoritative, trustworthiness. That's the trend. Google really wants to rank stuff that is super useful, that is accurate, that is helpful, that is not hurtful to people. And it just keeps getting better and better at doing that, even though you, everybody thinks their website's the best. The truth is, there's so much content out there. Google doesn't want to index everything. Google doesn't want to rank everything. Google just wants to rank and index the best of the best. And Google has so much to choose from, especially in the English language. I mean, in other languages, fine. You could probably, you know, get away with some spam. But when it comes to English languages, there's almost nothing out there that you can write about that's not been written about before multiple, multiple times. So mm -hmm. Google has a lot to select from. And Google's only going to rank the most useful stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I got to ask you this. Do you use Google, Barry? Yes. I do. <laughs> this is like maybe my quick fire round here. What other search engines are out there that maybe, I, I mean, do, do are there any search engines out there right now that are a legitimate contender as far as quality of results? Yeah, I mean, Bing is up there. Microsoft Bing does a pretty good job. It's just they, I honestly thought they would have more market share than they do now. They don't, but they do a very, very good job. They're they're serious about it. They index quick. They rank, they have pretty really good ranking algorithms. They have good spam protection. It's not as good as Google because they have a lot more data and machine learning to play with. But Bing is really up there. DuckDuckGo is trying, but their privacy first thing, especially after that privacy blunder a year or so ago is pretty bad right so i mean it's, it's really it's, it used to be remember like the bruce clay had this chart of like all the different search engines and who powered who that's no longer the case it's really just it's google i mean yeah. if there's google maybe a little bit of bing yahoo's dead sqs is gone by far there's DuckDuckGo, which uses i think microsoft actually there is there's a lot of specialty search engines as well so i'm not going to go into all of them but it's really all you have to worry about really today is google maybe something yeah yeah and and i noticed that even bing though they they've been doing a lot as far as webmaster tools and really providing a lot of information. I it really, I, I would say they're on par with Google with the amount of the information that they're enabling you as a webmaster to see about your site, the feedback that they're providing. Very serious about that. But like you, I, I, I do wish like you've got to let people know rather, rather than just being a default browser or the default search on a default browser, you got to do something. <laughs> Yeah, you do. Also, I mean, Yandex has pretty good webmaster tools if you're in the Russian space. So there are other like vertical or like language-based search engines that have a pretty good market share in certain regions. But like you said, Microsoft's doing a great job there. And they're also pushing this index now protocol significantly 
which was adopted by a number of many, many CMS platforms and providers, also adopted by obviously Bing themselves and Yandex and a bunch of other search engines. Google has not adopted it yet. I don't know if they will, probably not, but you know, because indexing is important. It's not like they really want, Google doesn't want to be just fed everything. They Them crawling the web is a signal of what's important and what's quality. So it's interesting to say, you see what Google does with that, if they ever do anything with that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the things I think they have said from day one is we'd rather find your content than have you submit it to us or, or have yeah. you feed it to it. And it's really interesting to see, I think even, you know, back in the day, we would run some tests about how Googlebot discovered things or if we launch a similar site at the same time without anything. Been, and, and it seemed to prove out that they would much rather find it rather than use your site map or, or have it submitted. What, and, and like you said, it's a quality signal. How does that work for someone who might not understand how the quality signals or indexing might go hand in hand? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to like specifically say. Obviously, I don't have access to Google's algorithm, but obviously links are still very important. The content of this page is important, but Google does understand how your website is linking internally. The internal linking structure is very important. Are the pages that you're linking to the most often linked to, you know, so often are how how where are they linked to on the page? What links are you having in your content itself? What does your navigation say about your website? So the structure user experience of your website does play a larger role especially today in terms of Google understanding what the most important, what you think the most important content on your website is. And Google will translate that to hopefully rank that most important content, you know, higher in the search results as well as crawl more often because it might be updated more often. But it's not as simple as that. I just want to kind of dumb, come very right. much so dumbing it down, but I just wanted to give a quick overview of it. No, that's cool. That, well, and anytime we're trying to look under the hood, I mean, it, it, it's the lights are, we really can't, you know, understand. We can just see the results and try and, Figure that out. What do you think about people? I mean, how many people have you encountered that, that you know, maybe try to tell you they have reverse engineered Google? I mean, how many times have you encountered that and what's your response to that? I think it's less so these days. It used to be a lot more in the early days and it was very easy to do back in the early days. It was really like when Google came out, it was really all about the links. I mean, it was super simple. You just go to some underground link network, you know, <laughs> buy some links or, or trade some links or do something for links. And you can literally outrank anybody for even their own brand name. That's not the case anymore. There are hundreds, if not thousands of different algorithms. Each algorithm is weighted differently based on different types of queries and so forth. So there's so many many different things out there. It's almost impossible to reverse engineer. I don't see people saying that often these days. But you definitely people have like their list of what the rate, what the different signals are, what the different ranking factors are and so forth. And those ranking factor lists have kind of died down. We haven't really seen many of those studies come out recently. Yeah. Uh, but those are fun to have anyway. I still miss those. But people would focus on the wrong things. That's the problem. Really, if you really build something that users really want and it's helpful, you'll get links. You'll get you know people going to your website. You'll get people enjoying your website. And Google will be able to understand your content. It's really useful. So it's more nuanced than that. But you know, it's, again, it's 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 something that I think all you really need to focus on when it comes to SEO is obviously. Don't use a good CMS that's search engine friendly. Almost every single content management system you use is search engine friendly. But really, after that, it's really building content that right. really people people want to consume in any format. Make it video, images, um, you know, blog posts, you name it, it. Google's really good at consuming that stuff. Absolutely. I think that's one of the biggest shifts. I, I think if, if I could go back and look at the past 20 years, one of the biggest shifts has been the the content management systems. You don't see nearly as many technical uh, indexing issues or uh, programming or, you know, the, the crazy URLs that used to be out there. To me, that's one of the things that I, I just don't see much of that anymore. And probably one of the, the biggest shifts is now you've got more search-friendly content management systems. You know, I think WordPress is, is over 40% of the internet. So it, it makes that part easier. And now people can focus on the content more. That's true. I mean, in the old days, it was very funny. Like you would we, that's why I was in business. I mean, one of the things we did was build search engine friendly front ends. Like yeah. you, the platforms back then, every single time you clicked on a URL, it would generate some type of weird URL parameter. And every year, every time it clicked, it would generate a new URL, which is like death with SEO. <laughs> yes. And you don't, the funny thing is, you talk to newer SEOs by newer, I mean, SEOs we've gotten in the space 12 years ago is right. newer. 
and they, they would have no clue about this. Like back in the old days, SEO was really about building websites that were search engine friendly, and that was a chal- a huge challenge. Yes, you kind of had a little bit about that when it came, when all these JavaScript platforms came out with React and Vue and so forth. But those really quickly adapted to make them somewhat search engine threat- friendly through different means. But again, it's funny. It's funny. That's there. I, I, I'm not a first, we're not a first generation SEO. First generation SEOs are before Google, like 1994 yep. to 1999. But our generation, when we first got, that was really about building platforms that could be indexed. And that was a huge challenge back then. And now it's like a joke. It's like everything you publish is, is, is crawled by Google and indexed and understood by Google. So I kind of find that funny, actually. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, early 2000s, I think, you know, I remember telling someone just build it out of HTML. Just don't do CMS, just build these flat pages. But even then, so uh, I have to tell you, like, like I, I love to say, you know, I've never done black hat, you know, I've never done stuff like that. But then I, li- I go back to, I think it was like 97, I downloaded a program and the sole purpose of that program was submitting pages to Alta Vista. And I would submit the... I would submit the 50 pages of my website and the 200 doorway pages that I created all night long to Alta Vista. And I would see my rankings change in the morning. <laughs> right. That was old fashioned SEO. That was what it was, which is it's funny. And then it became more about links shortly. Google made it all about links yeah. um, for sure. Yeah. yeah that, was, that was fun times. Well, it was and because people were saying, well, this is what you do. This is how you get the rankings. I'm like, wow, okay, it's it seems pretty easy, but yeah, absolutely. And, and it was before, you know, and and even to you would see people. I tell people sometimes the worst place to go for search engine advice is to a search engine because you've got all these legacy articles, these legacy documents that are still floating around. I didn't even know they were doorway pages. They were just help pages that were created by the software. And then later I'm like, it's funny, yeah. oh, I was making doorway pages. <laughs> I got to give Google credit. I mean, Google did a massive reworking of their help documentation over the past three years or so. And it's fabulous. They've done an amazing job kind of putting me out of business in terms of what I write because they pretty much rank for everything these days that I would generally write for. So they've done a great job there. Well, it's what is interesting, and I, I still kind of run into this today, But even in the conferences, when I would ask people, how many of you have read the Google guidelines? Just simply, did you read the Google guidelines? And I was amazed at how many people had never read them or even knew that they existed. And they were very clear, simple guidelines on how to build a site, how to do SEO, what to expect. But I was just very always surprised that people had not read them or even knew they existed. People just don't know. They don't know what they don't know also. So that's, a, that's another issue. If they're going to the conferences, then they learn, obviously. But a lot of people, they're busy running their businesses. The last thing they think about are, you know, how are search engines ranking my website? And what, are the, what do I, they just think you press a button and you rank number one, which again, if you, for us, it's like, it makes no sense. I mean, why should this website rank number one for AirPods versus another website ranking number one for AirPods? There's so many people who want to rank for AirPods, but people don't think that way. They just think, oh, I have a website about AirPods. It should rank number one. And I think once they start digging into that, then they realize there are guidelines, there are best practices, and they can learn about it. But a lot of people just are so busy running their own own businesses, they don't have time for it. (laughs) Absolutely. I I think I read a stat the other day that that the average small business owner would rather go to the dentist than do marketing. And so, I mean, it just makes sense because you've got to learn (laughs) so much. And especially when it comes to SEO, it's... It's like a never-ending volume of things you need to know. And yeah, once you dig into it, there's no bottom to it. Hey, everyone. This is Matt, and thanks for listening. Just a quick break in the middle of the podcast here to let you know there's a couple ways that you can connect with us. The first is learn.sitelogic.com. That's the learning site where you can see courses on analytics, courses on digital marketing across paid search, SEO, multiple disciplines. And then also, you can connect with us on Slack. Go to Slack if you're there and look for us at endlesscoffeecup.slack.com. Connect with us. I'd love to hear from you. Hear what ails you in the realm of digital marketing. Are there courses you need, information that you'd like to hear, or maybe some past guests? at you'd like to hear more from. Thanks again for being a listener of the Endless Coffee Cup, and I look forward to hearing from you. The cool thing is really, I mean, the fundamentals have not changed, which is pretty cool. Right.
Absolutely. Well, let's let's shift a little bit into the search results themselves. Over the years, I mean, that has been a mass. I, I, to me, that's one of the biggest changes that have happened over the years. I think it was, I want to say it was probably 2005, 2006 when Google started putting paid ads on. And I remember in the forums, that was like, that was death. People were people were declaring that Google was going to die because they put ads on, and and that was just, you know it was almost like this is this is this is sacred. You don't put ads here. But look at what we've got today. I mean, how in in your reporting and and your view over the years, how how have you seen the search engine results pages and how they've changed? Yeah, so I think Google started to launch. And they launched AdWords in like 2000. So even before I started writing about it. So Google ads were really always there from my perspective in 2000, at least when I started writing about it. Mm -hmm. The dynamic engine in terms of keyword rankings, a key, keyword basically like flat ads. These are like something would just buy and stick a banner ad on top. That was the early days. Right. But AdWords was really like, you know, a keyword based off. And that was like, you know, it was, it was we have ink to me back in the old days and so forth. So, so it wasn't fairly, it was people expected it. And that's how Google obviously monetized, and that's where they make most of their money even today. But in terms of the biggest like UI change that I remember early on was probably the universal search release, I think in 2007-ish, whenever that was, where Google would not just list the web results, the, the 10 blue links, but it would actually show video or images or news or sometimes audio, and you name it. And now when you do a search today, you expect to get all this information. Google, like if you're looking for a video or you do a search for you know, something image-related, Google's going to show you that at the top. And it was a way for SEOs to be like, oh, I no longer have to just optimize for my website for 10 blue links. I can optimize this video. I can optimize this, you know, this piece of multimedia data or, or this audio file or a PDF or whatever it might be. And I can rank in vertical search or universal search a little bit easier than I would be able to rank for in web search. So it was just another opportunity. It was SEOs were not happy about it when it happened because it was a change, but it was another opportunity for SEOs to adapt and get better at other things that they can go ahead and utilize to rank and get traffic to their websites. Absolutely. I, I think actually, I, I think Ask was doing that before Google implemented it. I think Ask was adding more and more multimedia or more, we, we would call it rich results. That was, I, I, mean, I love Jeeves. I, I absolutely love Jeeves. It breaks my heart that they are no longer around because that was, that was my favorite. I was pulling for them, but I, I think they kind of shot themselves in the foot. It reminds me, like, when Ash G's retired, when they retired him, and that was under Jim Lanzone's reign, who's now, like, a top executive at, you name it. He's been top executives across Yahoo and lots of different websites. Anyway, I think he's doing well. But I remember, like, they had a whole, like, Ash G's retirement.com website, and they let that expire after a year, and some porn site took it over. And that had so many links to it. It was just so oh. funny to see. So Ash G's became a porn star in his later life. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I remember, yeah, they rebranded it to just ask and, and it was still pretty good for a while. But then it's like Google did what they did better. They took what yeah. they were doing, just made it better, made it easier. And and yeah, now, I mean, what we've got now for universal search, it's amazing how much is on. I, I think I was, I was putting together a, a training program on SEO the other day, and I'm trying to get a snapshot of the results page. And it's just amazing how many things now are showing up for different types of searches that actually to get to the organics, it's it's pretty low on the page. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, that's that was the that's still the biggest complaint. Also, the one click, the zero clicks, the you know, people. It's kind of exaggerated with Rand Fishkin's studies and stuff because again, if you search for how old was Barack Obama, you know, you're not converting on that. Right. But if you do a much detailed query and do your comments related queries, you're gonna convert on that type of stuff. So in everything, that's that's the beauty of the space. Again, it's like SEOs look for ways to optimize and to take advantage and see an opportunity in the change, even though they might complain about it, they always find an opportunity in those changes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me, what's, so since you've been reporting on this, I mean, what's, what's been your perception of, of SEOs over the years? I mean, has that changed the people that, that are consuming, that are reading your articles? What, what's kind of been the change over time in your perspective? So the perception about SEO has always been poor from outside of the SEO community. That has not changed. I don't think it's getting any better. It's sad, but it's still the perception. SEOs make, it's basically we try to manipulate the search results to show things that were not meant to be shown. And that's not true. SEOs mostly try to just, you know, make sure their client's stuff that is relevant for a query is ranking for that query and try to push that up yeah. as best as possible. But they're not really trying to 
hurt the web. I mean, most are. There are some black hat SEOs that do. But that's still the perception. It's it's the perception is is negative outside of the SEO community about the SEO community. And hopefully that will change, but it hasn't changed in 20 plus years. In terms of like SEOs themselves, I think they have more chilled out. It used to be much more, I think we've we've had so many battle scars over the years. We, our, our skin has grown thicker. I think we've been through a lot of penalties over the years. We've been through a lot of ups and downs. I think we are much more, we're able to tolerate those changes better than we used to be in the old days. So I think we're just a much more mature industry, a lot more people in the industry, and it's more legitimate. There's a lot more budget out there as well. And, I think that's a good thing. Absolutely. And it's so I did a, a podcast a couple months ago with Greg Jarbo. Um, and, and it was about why doesn't SEO get as much credibility? Why, why is it not seen as, as critical as like a social media or some other areas? Because it just seems like over the years, you know, different technologies, social media being probably the biggest one, it's kind of supplanted SEO as this is the latest and greatest, but yet. When you look at the data, SEO is still responsible for the greatest amount of traffic to your site. Have you seen that as well as you as you write about it and, and get feedback from the industry? Yeah, the issue is it's also a way of how people have changed. If you just want things quicker, they just people are on TikTok and Instagram and they don't have patience to read stuff. <laughs> So like even my family members, it's they see something on, on Instagram and they believe it. And I'm like, I don't know if you ever read any SEO advice on Instagram or TikTok. It's horrid. It is bad. It is wrong. And that's the topic I know. It's like you're listening to Congress or the senators talk about how SEO is this or Google is that. And they have no clue what they're talking about. Right. It's just completely wrong. And it's in, that's the problem with this type of there is is because you can't really prove yourself on a TikTok in a, in a 20 second TikTok or a YouTube short or something like that. But yeah, that's how could people consume content. And maybe that's our fault as educators in this area. We should probably be out there more in those areas to kind of educate people. Maybe you are. I'm not sure if you are not. I'm not. I, I'm not. But uh, it's, it's an issue. And I think when it comes to why this is the case, I just I, th I think just people, it's the way people are. Mm -hmm. I think people are just more, it's a different personality these days. People aren't willing to sit down print out something and read it or read it on the screen for too long, they need the answer now, instant gratification. Wow. And that's not going to change. Absolutely. I, well, yeah. So I'm doing a lot of training in SEO and, and digital and kind of the whole breadth of digital, but I find it interesting when I go to different countries, especially where, you know, the internet or devices really didn't make their entrance into that culture or that region until around 2000s or kind of the end of that first decade there. I'll go into some countries where Instagram is king. And it's mainly because when the internet really started gaining momentum there, it was all on mobile devices. And so it was all about apps. It was all about social and I remember someone asking me that, you know, I'm doing really well on Instagram, but what's the next level? And I asked him, well, how many times a day do you use Google? They're like, oh, I use it all day long. I use it every time I want something. I'm like, have you ever thought about getting a website in there so that when someone searches for you, they'll be found? Oh, that's amazing. Like it had never occurred to them to put their business where in Google, where people would look for it, because to them, Instagram was the world. Instagram was where I find things. It's where I, I discover new things. And so it's really interesting getting into different areas or regions where like we grew up with the PC and internet like together. And so website was our first prism through seeing the world. It was the first way of seeing that. And then, you know, running into this in different cultures, it's really amazing. Like you said, there's so much out there and People are getting information just in little tiny sound bites off of some social media rather than, and I think that was the value to those old forms. It was debate. It was argument. It was, you need to prove this. You just can't say it. It, it was absolutely amazing how that's changed. I really love that observation about you know, we're chilled out, but yet other people are taking the conversation over. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a different industry than it was, but. Again, there's also people, there's like, there's SEO departments in Wall Street Journal. There's SEO departments in every Fortune 500. So we're out there, and I think it's definitely more legitimate. But we've, yeah, we've experienced a lot of worse, worse scars over the years, and we're able to handle that now. 
I th- very true. I, I was hearing someone who uh, they'd been in the SEO and kind of making fun of the social team when Instagram made their change to video first, kind of like standing back to the side going, ha ha, it's happening to you now. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not fun, is it, when there's a change in the algorithm? <laughs> What has been your, let me just ask, what has been, you know, what are some of the events in the SEO world or, or some of the things that have been, I, I, you know, either in person at an event or anything that it's really kind of caused, I, I would say, a shift in the industry or a different way of thinking? That's a good question. A shift in the industry. I can tell you one thing I had a, a private meeting with with the head of search back, I mean, Singal, who was the head of search at Google for many, 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 many years. He no longer at Google for the past several years. And we were talking about when I think featured snippets just came out. And the featured snippets didn't actually have links or visible links to the cited sourcing. Like it was basically just have the answer and no reference. I'm like, I, I'm like, I, I said, this is going to be upsetting because people, this is content from people's websites and you're not linking to it. They eventually added a link and every SEO now wants to be in a feature snippet. This, this, nobody will debate that. But what he told me was like, and it kind of like pushed me back a little bit. It was like, we care. Our fundamental thing is the number one thing we care about is to make the searcher happy. And I'm like, oh, wait, I didn't even think about it from that perspective. Maybe SEO should really think about how is Google going to go about making the searcher happy? Forget about how Google's going to make me, the web, the publisher or the site owner or the SEO happy. Right. Obviously, they're using our content. They have to make us happy, but they don't really have to. All they really care about is to make the searcher happy so they come back for more searches, click on more ads, and come back more for more. So that kind of like set me back. We're like, wait, that kind of changed my mindset. This was early, early on. So that was one of the things that I think really wow. you know, set me straight. That yeah, great advice from that. I mean, that's that's their customer. So absolutely, that that is a really cool, really cool experience there. Any other experiences with with maybe SEO execs or or search engines that what is what's like your career highlight in reporting on search engines? Oh, I, I was in Brian Williams before he was a scandal. Um, ah. So Brian Williams on Channel. Or I think NBC Nightly News. And this is kind of with the Universal Search. When it came out, I kind of found it before anybody else found it. <laughs> and I got a call from his his team saying, "Do you want to be on? You know, you know, want to come out to we'll send a, a team to you, or go out to Indian Rock, or what's it called? Whatever that place is in in downtown in Midtown, New York City." Okay. So I went to there. Off, I went there. I had massive cameras all over me. I spoke to them maybe for like an hour, and it was wow. on primetime TV. And then something happened and my segment was cut down to like maybe like three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so I was on primetime TV for like three seconds, which is pretty fun. Yeah. That was, I'll, never, I'll never forget that. And then my fundamental shifts, I guess, is Matt Cutts leaving Google. That was pretty significant. Danny Sullivan joining Google. That sent my word upside down. Right. Matt Cutts. Right. Yeah, Danny Sullivan going. So those types of, those are the, like those things that kind of like fundamentally shifted everything in the, in the industry for me. That yeah, you you just laid out a couple of things there. Yeah, the the, the changes and the moving around and and yeah, Danny going to Google, seeing his name come up in articles when they want to know something about Google, and he's like the spokesperson is just such a it, it, it shakes me. It's like wait a minute, how, how? <laughs> I'm used to Danny being quoted as you know as as editor, and now he's spokesperson. So it, it's it's a real paradigm shift to see that happening. <laughs> For sure. What, well, what Matt you, Cuts is like totally out of it now. Yeah. I mean, he's not even, I think he's just enjoying his retirement. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that's, I think we're getting to that stage now where I think we're, go, you know, those that have been in for a couple decades now, they're, they're either kind of starting to retire, they're finding other things. It's, it's, I don't know, we're going to have to have like retirement parties or something for yeah. some of the, the older ones as they're going and we'll see who's still going. <laughs> Sure. What do you see maybe the next five years in search? I, I, you've got a wealth of history to draw from, but where do you see things going? Oh, that's a tough one. That's tough. I mean, it's it's really tough. I think voice search has been very interesting, but it hasn't grown as much as I thought it would. I mean, it's all about the devices. Whatever's changing with these devices is not just computer screen. It's more about these devices and what's changing. And the iPhone hasn't changed in a long time. Mm-hmm. I mean, having folding phones, what are we going to have? I don't know. Honestly, I... I 
I, I thought voice would be everywhere in your ear. I have AirPods in. I thought that would really trigger everything. I don't know. We have these, I have these devices on my desk, like these Google Home devices, Apple Siri devices, Home Pods, and so forth. So. I thought full voice would be more into my car, to my fridges, everywhere. But I don't know. I, I really don't know what the future is. It's still always been about those that that search box, that typing in a search query into that box and getting results. And as John Mueller said numerous times, that's no different when it comes to voice search. It's no different when it comes to using Google Lens and stuff like that. So I don't know. I'm not sure what's going to be the next. I think you're going to see more quality improvements through Google, and more better quality. It's going to make it harder for people to build websites that compete in search that's always going to be the case but i don't know what the next like oh my god this is going to be the next big thing i, I don't have a good answer for you mm. sorry no it's interesting i i because so much has been tied to the device it's been the it, it's been the success as well as the downfall when the device doesn't match the intent of what's happening but yeah i mean that that's it's all about that search box and uh, yeah it, it's interesting yeah, i don't see that changing much either as long as people are using it unless we have a new device at the market we don't know about i i really i, I love that answer because that is it, there's a hardware limitation it, it's the latest piece of hardware the iphone that changed i think a significant amount like you said how is ai moving into search more and more and and i've seen things on both sides about how mum is working, how mom is not working. Where are you on that? What have you observed? So mom is in very, very specific applications. And mom is just one of many AIs, machine learning algorithms that Google uses. So people make a lot of big deal about it because Google's been making, making, making a big deal over, over the past couple of years now. But mom is very, very limited use. Super limited. It's, it's ridiculous how little they use it. So I wouldn't focus on mom, but machine learning and AI is very, very significant in terms of um, how Bing and Google use, you know, figure out algorithm rankings in search, figure out features in search also, like featured snippets and where to lay out different elements in search. It's all done based off of these machine learning algorithms, which make everything much more complicated. In terms of using AI and machine learning for SEO purposes, like generating content or <laughs> stuff like that, that's been fairly interesting because this last helpful content update seems to have hit a lot of machine generated, AI generated types of content. Mm. So I found that very interesting as well. I don't know. And that's I just found it very, very interesting to see that. So we'll see. All right. Good. Yeah, it's I, I'm looking forward to this helpful content update. I, I I've heard many people kind of complaining about results and how you're seeing sort of these directory sites taking over that if I want a plumber, what I get is directories taking up all the organic results rather than actual, you know, the actual websites or the actual people that I would call. So I'm hoping sites like that are kind of filtered through as well. But like you said, the, the your money, your life, a lot of things hidden as well. I, I yeah, so the AI generated content, I, I had a question about that the other day about using AI generated content for your website. <laughs> I was like, we're, we're eventually going to have robots writing the content and robots evaluating the content and maybe robots doing the searches, but how as, in terms of the quality of results, are we, I, where have you seen, and, and I have seen a couple of articles complaining about Google's quality maybe going down or going different or different than it once was with all of this AI coming in. Where do you see that and, and how is that affecting the results? That's a good question. So AI content is not there yet. I mean, there's been some examples of content, you know, ranking fairly well with AI, but I think that's why Google came out with this helpful content update. I think Google's like Google, we see this often, especially with Panda and Penguin and you know, like a lot of people writing about how poor the quality of the results are. Then Google comes out with an algorithm kind of to like target that as well. So I think, I think I'm not sure. I think it was targeting some of those efforts to generate the ability to generate fast what appear, appears to be quality content really isn't. A lot of SEOs are using it for many good purposes, like to help them supplement a lot of their content. So ways to get fill in content and add more information to their content that might, they might not have thought about. But I think overall, you could leverage the AI and machine learning to really build a great piece of content as long as you have a human kind of fill in the blanks and, and update it so that it's not just generated by a machine completely, that it's actually reviewed and fixed by a human. It's not there yet. It will be at one point and it will rank pretty well, but it's not there yet. How is that in the results? Do you see the, the machine learning being effective in creating good quality results? I haven't seen much of it. We've done some XMX sessions on how to use GDP3 and different types of machine learning and AI generated things to create content, but there's not hasn't been really something solid yet that works perfectly. There are some SEOs doing some really cool stuff. I don't want to like negate it all, 
but I don't think we're there yet in terms of mainstream streaming it. I don't see a lot of it. I mean, I can't tell you if I see it or not, because if it's really good and I see it, it might not, <laughs> it might be machine generated, it might be written by a human. I don't know. So it's hard to know. Absolutely. Oh man, Barry, it has been such a pleasure catching up with you and, and checking in and seeing what, you know, congratulations. I mean, you're almost at 25 years now, you, you know, or 20 years at 23. Yeah, that's right. 20 years doing that. So congratulations. What's been the most rewarding of, of doing this? So the most rewarding part probably for me is helping people, I guess, new jobs, really. I mean, I can't tell you, I'm surprised. I mean, you know, I help them get as cost, speaking gig at, at XMX, or I mention them on an article, or I share something that they write, and it ends up helping them promote their career and maybe get a job they were looking for, or maybe get a raise or something. Having these networking conferences, people can network with each other and find jobs. That, that's the probably one of the most rewarding things. So it helps them and their families move forward a step. Helping people obviously with any questions they might have. That's always rewarding. So it's all about the help. You know, if people reach out and say, "Hey, you help me here and there." That's great. Most people don't tell me anything, but some people will be like, will see me at an event and say, you don't know this, but I'm like, oh, wow. It means a lot when you hear that. It keeps you going. It keeps you wanting to keep doing what you're doing. So I appreciate the community. They've done a lot for me and hopefully I've done a little bit for them. That is awesome. I love hearing that. That that is so cool that, yeah, when you've been instrumental in helping others and and their success, that is an amazing, amazing reward. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. Oh, man. Barry, it has been a pleasure talking with you. Where can people find you if they want to know more information? Where can they also subscribe to your articles? Yeah, good question. So I'm very active on Twitter. My handle is Rusty Brick, R-U-S-T-Y-B-R-I-C-K. My website is RustyBrick.com. You can learn more about me there at RustyBrick.com slash Barry. My sites I write on are Search Engine Roundtable, Search Engine Land. You can Google those things. I also have a YouTube channel, which I produce two pieces of content every single week. One is a recap of all the SEO changes that happened over the week. Wow. And also, like I, vlog, I do a vlog where I interview different personalities in the industry, just like you're doing with me. So maybe I'll get you on the vlog one day. It'll be fun to do it. All right. So definitely check out that. And thanks for so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, dear listener, I hope you have been taking notes through this interview. This has been an SEO information dump from the fire hose here. You can't get, I think, closer to the search engines than Barry Schwartz if you're wanting to know how SEO works or what's going on in search. So I highly recommend you follow Barry, read his stuff, watch his videos, because you will know what's going on and be prepared, hopefully, for just about anything that Google can do. Barry, it's been a pleasure having you here. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, dear listener, I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Endless Coffee Cup. Look forward to having another cup of coffee and a conversation with you. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.